This is part two of three. If you've missed part one, then check it out via the link in the show notes. So um, I guess the caveat also would be that a lot of the points I'm going to be talking about, um, I have already spoken about in depth in my conclave talk of this year, which I realize at this point in time has not quite been released to the public yet, but I think it's on its way. Uh, perhaps early next year sometimes so stay tuned if you're really into the divine feminine in Sethian Gnosticism I do go into Isis I do go into Barbello it's a whole thing so stay tuned for that episode but for now I kind of just want to give a really brief overview um so Gnosticism is it a thing is it not a thing depends who you ask but I'm in team yes it is a thing um it's yeah, something but, but, that... believe it or not so am I <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be kind of a funny show if I wasn't. You know, I don't really, uh, I don't really think it's a thing. Yeah, it's okay, continue. But it, it, it obviously is, and every scholar, well, I shouldn't say every, <laughs> many, many brilliant scholars, including ones we've had on, on the show, say that it's not. But even brilliant people can be wrong, very wrong. Okay, continue. Well, I, I think it's just a matter of perspective, really. If, yeah. if we understand not like the right perspective yeah. and a wrong perspective, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm continuing to be facetious. Sorry, uh, they're just wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. Um, that's fine. No. no, so if we if we view Gnosticism from the perspective of that it was a particular spiritual movement that's happening at a very particular time in history, um, as a kind of I guess precursor to kind of early Christianity, yes, it definitely is a thing. If we're going to use the word Gnosticism to talk point blank about one cohesive tradition, bam, bam, that's absolutely wrong. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about when I say Gnosticism, just to kind of clarify these terms, is that I'm really only going to be talking about the Sethians um, because they're kind of our very first kind of inter- iteration of, of, quote, Gnosticism, and they're kind of the, the, the ones that really kind of play quite heavily with these Platonic and Judaic ideas and kind of turn them into some kind of cohesive system, although we will see in a moment how that how that system kind of changes between texts. Yes, yes, exactly. And it, and uh, again, even even the term Cephian is, is a little bit tricky, but it does seem mm-hmm. like some of the groups that created the Cephian texts might have called, you know, some of them called themselves the Standing Ones, some of them called yes. themselves the Kingless Ones, and some of them called themselves the Knowers, right? So the, the, yes. the, the groups that created the Cephian texts were literally, quite probably, the group that called themselves the Gnostics. So. Yes, um, and then, of course, we have the term Gnostic um, and Cephian uh, from Irenaeus who was writing his book on heresies and he calls this particular group of people the Gnostics, the knowers, those who think that they know, right? Yep. So um, so very briefly, in a nutshell, so uh, Gnosticism in general, however, encompasses a kind of typical example of the different kind of disparate religious traditions that were happening in the Hellenistic world at this period of time, also centralized around Egypt, right? So this is kind of uh, fundamentally where um, a lot of the Gnostic traditions are born is out of it, out of Egypt. Um, so questionably, I'm not sure if Gnosticism is a religion, but it's certainly some kind of philosophy, um, perhaps with a practical component, no one's quite sure, uh, but it definitely focuses on skepticism, on inquiry, on religious eclecticism, There's doctrines of salvation. There's this doctrine of this kind of release of the soul or this longing to escape this mortal coil, this physical vessel, this meat sack, whatever you want to say. Uh, People think that it's it's kind of the soul is imprisoned in this body, in this mortal world. That's kind of generally across the board in most iterations of Gnosticism. And there's kind of this longing or this uh, wanting to return to the soul's native realm. In Gnosticism, this realm is called the Pleroma, but as we've seen in Platonism, it's the realm of forms um, or the realm of the father, uh, the one, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here, um, the realm of the one, the noose, the mind of God, right? Yeah, and um, just, to, just to push it in one of my other my other bugaboos, because I think people can also kind of see some of the connections to this uh, with like Numinius and some of these other Platonic thinkers, right? So it's it's the Gnostics do take it to a new extreme, but you know this body hating dualist, uh, we we just want to get out as our whole bag. I think is it. There's a lot of truth to it. It's right there in the text, but yes. but it is over exaggerated a little bit because they are still like, well, we're here and we got to do something here because this this is where where we're at, which I think is also a perspective that you that you see in, in their fellow Platonists, right? Um, and I, I think too that you know there's this alienation 
um, this, uh, d- as Jesus says, to, to be in the world and not of it, is doesn't mean that that you can't act in this world, appreciate this world, have a foot in this world and perhaps another. So sorry, just just to stick in some of my my my, my personal bugaboos there, uh, <laughs> my my own uh, maybe my own neuroticism. Uh, but please continue. No, I totally agree. And I'm very much of the same mind as well. You know, I think uh, Gnosticism in general gets a bad rap. It gets tarred with the with the dualism brush. It gets tarred with the world-hating brush. And I think that's just lazy. That's lazy yeah. scholarship. Because when you go in and read the text, that's not necessarily what it's saying. No. And it might be kind of the vibe for one specific text, but you can't tar the entire Nag Hammadi corpus with that same brush because oh. it's just lazy scholarship and, and even in reading. secret john which, which i'm sure we'll get to which is sort of yes. like the the archetypical Sethian text you know they have a lot of issues with the body but you know what they're really obsessed with is fate which we've talked about yes. man they whew, man <laughs> don't get me started on fate and, <laughs> and and what they call the counterfeit spirit which we'll get to that you know they, they're not big fans of the body but they you know there's groups at the same time uh, other christians and other Platonists and other jewish uh and uh, Greek philosophies that are much, 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 I'm going to say like 10 more muches here, like <laughs> harsher on the body, right? Yeah, and like they're, compared to some of the other ascetic Christian streams at the time, they are chill about the body. But it's really, you know, okay, yeah, the body in this sort of platonic sense, you know, it traps us, it weighs us down, it, it can lead us into this, this kind of negativity, but it's it's fate and the counterfeit spirit. You know, those those are the, don't get me started on those, those are the things that are, that we're, that we're really against, in, in my reading of, of Secret John. So, okay, so to, to, to stop derailing, let's hop back on this, this, this Gnosticism train. No, I think it's really important, actually, because, yeah, like I said, there's these very specific uh, terms or kind of ideas that get kind of lumped onto this term called Gnosticism, and I think it's really important to unpack that because there's a whole different uh, whole different heap of things that are happening, different traditions at different time periods by different people, and like you said, there's other other groups that are not even Gnostic that are just like so much worse, right? So, yeah, I'm I'm going to die on that hill. Um, and I, I hope you join me on that, Jonathan. <laughs> um, all right. So to return to broadly defining Gnosticism, uh, like I was saying, uh, there's this return to, you know, this, this kind of uh, spiritual realm of celestial divine light, uh, what the, the Gnostics call the Pleroma. Um, but most importantly, there is the uh, the concept of two creator deities. And in a Gnostic context, uh, well, I guess also in a Platonic context, the creator deity is not the same and not identical to the supreme deity. That's a really fundamental concept. Um, we also have the concept of salvation, which is attained through gnosis and the recognition of one's true spiritual identity. That's really fundamental in Gnosticism. Um, Gnostic mythology is very prevalent and has a specific literary character. And I guess that might also be a bias in sources. We obviously only have literary sources that we can go by. We don't have anything else archaeologically present in the record or we don't have any kind of practical texts or manuals. So I guess we're only limited by, by what we have. Um, but when you start getting into the crux, when you start reading this collection of texts, it's incredibly bizarre. It's incredibly rich. It's full of mysteries. It's full of paradoxes. And it's kind of, that's what makes it diverge from uh, straight up philosophy, right? Because philosophy is usually concerned with rational argument, with ordering things. But that's not necessarily what we see in a lot of the Gnostic texts. Right. No, and it's it's not just for for uh, you can read lots of ancient texts and they're bizarre for modern people, but you know they're they're bizarre and weird and puzzling. I think in any context and are are kind of deliberately so. And I, yeah. I th- think the people at the time reading, well, we know we're not going to skip ahead to Neoplatonism, but we know at the time, <laughs> uh, well, we're in the we're in the era of Irenaeus. Uh, you know, they that the ancient people agreed with. Them. So we were talking about. Uh, I just want to kind of finish a, a little bit about what Gnosticism actually is. So we were talking about the mystery and the paradoxes but um, fundamentally a lot of the texts that we have are kind of uh, you know a cosmology uh, an explanation for the origin and the nature of the universe it's kind of like this really good uh, juicy stuff um, but what sets Gnosticism more specifically Sethian Gnosticism apart is that there's an exegesis on Jewish and Christian scripture mic drop right it's this 
specifically the book of Genesis. So we don't have this kind of lofty platonic kind of understanding of the world and the creation of the universe. We have all that, but it's like copied and pasted or like splattered onto the book of Genesis, right? Because I guess that's some something that's fundamentally missing from Genesis, right? It, it begins with God created, but like who is God? Where does he come from? Like who what are his motivations? Has he ever been like does he have yeah. a mum? Why why is there two creation yeah. stories in that dang book? Like, right? And yeah. I think maybe this is something that people were or you know, perhaps Hellenistic Jews or Jews into Philo were thinking about, like, okay, well, we're reading and interacting with a lot of pagan literature, which has these elaborate cosmologies, these theogonies, um, this kind of interaction between gods, but our book only has one god, potentially, perhaps maybe two, depends what people think. But where did he come from? What's his backstory? So I think this is perhaps uh, a way of kind of <laughs> giving Judaism or uh, Judaic scripture a backstory, right? Yeah, it's the Genesis for Genesis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's Genesis squared. Yeah. Um, so, of course, as we, we're going to kind of get into there, it's basically kind of um, not a direct kind of taking of the account of Timaeus, but there are kind of T Timaeusian ideas, I guess. But I guess uh, generally there's Platonic ideas kind of peppered and sprinkled throughout. Um, but I guess a little bit about the overall experience or what the books or the kind of mythology, Gnostic mythology, is trying to convey is there's this kind of experience of alienation, right? Um, it's kind of there's an undertone or message of there's this kind of triumph over adversity. Um, and there's obviously an emphasis on the way to overcome adversity is kind of focusing on that spiritual dimension of life as opposed to the material, right? There's obviously some kind of fundamental disconnect between the world that these people were living in, the second and third century CE, the Roman period um, in Egypt or elsewhere. There's kind of this, um, and I think this is kind of a universal tendency and something that I love studying about the ancient world is that we're still now grappling with these same ideas, although we're living in a different time and space. This, how, how do we be human beings? What's the point of life? Why are we here? You know, what's the nature of the soul? Do we have a soul? What happens when we die? There's all the, all these questions that kind of keep coming up throughout history. And, and this is just one specific answer, a snapshot in one point in time in history. Um, but there's, there's this kind of, um, emphasis on this kind of cosmic drama. There's like all this stuff that happens up in the cosmos, even before humanity is created, right? There's this kind of drama that's unfolding in the cosmos. Um, but planted within that drama are seeds of redemption for the human soul, right? It's, it's not just all, you know, brimstone and fire and we're all doomed. That's absolutely not the story that Gnostic texts are trying to convey. Um, there is, absolutely an opportunity for redemption but the redemption has to come through our own um, making which is aided or supplemented by uh by the divine entities that are kind of uh, within the pleroma that are present within our lives but that are contained within the divine spark that's that's in all of us right i think that's fundamentally kind of the crux of what all these texts are trying to say would you agree would you disagree jonathan Oop, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm on mute. Okay, well, yeah, the, the audience at home is like, thank God. <laughs> um, no, I, I obviously, absolutely agree. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good. We're, yeah. we're on the same team. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't, so... I don't think I've disagreed of anything you've said yet. So. Yeah, okay, well, that's good. <laughs> There's no, no major theological issues that we're going to wrestle over. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so then, as I said, I'm going to be speaking specifically about the Sethians, and as I said before, I've done an entire conclave talk about the Sethians and who they are, so this is not in any way going to be in-depth. Um, if you want in-depth, please go off and listen to that once it's released, or there's also fantastic resources online that you can also look at as well. 
we'll, we'll link to it if if it is out uh, because uh, as we're talking, lifting again the curtain. If you if you want to get into the, the pleroma, the to to the secret uh, uh, Gnostic uh, conclave behind the conclave, uh, the, uh, we're not sure when the show is going to come out. We're not even going to tell you when it's being recorded. Maybe it'll come out tomorrow. Maybe it'll come out next year. But there is a chance that your Sapien talk will be out. We'll link it up, and of course, you're yes. going to love it if you love this and you do love this. So continue. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so we have to kind of uh, spoiler alert that the, the people that are writing these texts did not actually call themselves Sepian, right? So this is a later designation by scholars who are writing in the 20th, 21st century, but it's also a term that's used uh, contemporaneously by Irenaeus, right? He yeah. dumps this label onto this particular kind of group of Gnostic-ish kind of people. Um, don't, and why- Don't add yeah. us Dylan Burns. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, love your work, Dylan Burns. Um, he, and yeah, so Irenaeus kind of groups or kind of consolidates this this terminology because fundamentally, what's kind of a, a recurrent theme in these texts is that these texts mention this figure of Seth, both the divine, the cosmic Seth, and the kind of terrestrial Seth, which is present obviously in Genesis. Um, but the the kind of terminology that these people who are writing the text use to describe themselves um, as kind of really lofty language, actually, that they, they describe themselves, you know, as the sons of light, the seed of Seth, the children of Seth, the immovable, incorruptible race, the great generation, right? There's like a bit of self-aggrandizement here, right? But it's also, you know, one thing that they kind of don't, really say is, hey, we are the Sethians. It's with the children, the seed, the light of Seth, right? So who is Seth and why is he so important? Well, um, in a Gnostic context or in a Sethian Gnostic context, he's the bearer and transmitter of the authentic image of the spiritual Adam. So the spiritual Adam, of course, is kind of, I guess we could refer that to the rational soul. And Seth is kind of like the um, heavenly, the pleromic embodiment of, of those principles, right? Um, so thank God for us, we have 14 treatises within the Narcomati Corpus <laughs> that have been categorized as Sethian and there's air quotes for people who are listening on the podcast. Um, but the three really that I'm going to be talking about today, because I think the three of them together kind of hash out the cosmology are, of course, the Apocryphon of John, which we have in four copies, both the long version and the short version. And if you have not read the Apocryphon of John, please pause the podcast. Go off and read it. Um, pause, also, go pause and right read now. It. I, yes, I, pause right now. Uh, Gnosis.org, they actually have all four versions. All uh, for you free can, as well. Yep. yep. Yep, and you can. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. There's, there's, um, there's so many. Anyways, you can read, you can read all the different versions. You can read it in yes. one sitting. Uh, so yeah, pause, go read that, come back, yes. and uh, yeah, continue, rock on. Oh, and sorry, and be careful, be careful. Us. We're still getting some sound. From, oh, uh, sorry, from the mics. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm getting overzealous. Um, yeah. But whilst, whilst you're there at gnosis.org, you can also read the Trimorphic Protonoia and you can also read the Gospel of the Egyptians. Um, and, yes, you, you can read them in one sitting. They're not very long, but they're incredibly complex and profound, and I'm going to try and p- unpack that um, in, in some kind of feasible way right now. So go off and read those first and then come back for the unpacking. Yeah, if you've um, read those and you're like, I have no idea what any of that is. Although the context <laughs> from our, this is probably our second show, from our last two, from this show and the previous yeah. one, we should give you, the, uh, stuff will be sounding familiar. But if you're completely, if you're like, what what the F was that? Which I think was my first reaction to reading the yeah. Apophrakana, John. Look, look, we have we, we have the incarnation of Sophia herself. <laughs> Joanne Leone is going to break it down for you. So uh, anyway, yeah. Um, all right, well... I guess the fundamental point to take from that as well is that, like I said before, most of these books are an exegesis on the biblical book of Genesis or they're kind of prefiguring the the pre-Genesis, right? So we're trying to kind of make some sense of that in a Hellenistic, philosophical, Jewish kind of way. All right, so shall we get right into the Gnostic cosmology? Okay, this is the part everyone's been waiting for, I hope. Um, so I want to say a little bit about a couple of terms, um, a couple of uh, divine figures, and I kind of just want to hash out their kind of uh, relevance and their kind of platonic symbolism as well. So, of course, as I was saying before, we have the realm of the Pleroma. 
um, which in a in a kind of Gnostic context is the noose or the divine mind of the one. Remember, Plato's one. Um, but in a Gnostic context is called usually the unknowable father. Um, so this kind of the Pleroma is a realm of like profound living silence. It's also called the living silence. Um, the kind of the glory in the construction of the Pleroma is through direct emanation of the father, right? So it's kind of this like incredibly lofty celestial intellectual realm that kind of belongs to the to Plato's one, right? It's kind of this, yeah, completely lofty and unknowable. Um so that that is great. So um the unknowable father in 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 some of the texts that I've just mentioned, which hopefully now you have read, um, he's also described, I think this is from the uh the Gospel of the Egyptians, he's described as the great invisible spirit, the father whose name cannot be uttered. He who came forth from the heights of the perfection, the light of the light of the aeons of light, the light of the silence of the providence and the father of the silence, the light of the word and the truth, the light of the incorruptions, the infinite light, the radiance from the aeons of light of the unrevealable, unmarked, ageless, unproclaimable father, the aeon of the aeons, autogenies, self-begotten, self-producing, alien, the really true aeon. So <laughs> it's no surprising if you're reading that in the text, that thing, um, particularly if you don't have a thorough understanding of uh, Platonism, which I hope uh, now you do, having listened Maybe. to part one of the podcast. <laughs> um, so as we can see, yeah, so something about the Pleroma, obviously, is that it's a realm of light. Um, if that wasn't immediately obvious from the 15 times light was mentioned in that quote. Um, but it's a realm of profound silence. and you know, talking to people who have had kind of not quite a samadhi experience but who have had kind of really profound, deep spiritual experiences. Um, Bishop Tim is a great person to talk to about this. Um, a lot of the kind of commonalities or common experiences that people describe when they they enter into this, this deep, profound place of stillness, this place of quiet, this place of light. So I think um, the, the best human terminology that we have to do kind of describe the Pleroma, to describe the unknowable father, the Plato's one, is through silence, is through light. Um, so from the father, the unknowable father, come three powers. Okay, so confusingly that is another father, that is the mother, and that is the son. So, hmm, so um, it's kind of familiar, but and, and again, there are there are actually literally flow charts of this. But um, yes, yeah, uh, I, I believe uh, Father Tony has made some good flow charts somewhere yes. around in the internet. Yes, maybe we can link those as well. Yeah. Um, cool. So the father, then, so not the unknowable father, but the second father, which uh, of course, uh, if we've been paying attention, is Plato's monad. Um, kind of really sets up the kind of primary structures, um, primary and secondary structures actually of the divine mind, of the noose of God. Okay, so uh, and what I really enjoy about the Sethian text in particular is that we have a lot more information. We, we have an understanding of what the hell is going on with the Father, what is happening in the Pleroma, like what is it constructed of, what does it look like. So uh, from the father, of course, comes the emanation of Barbello, which is the mother, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but within the kind of realm of the father, we have concepts floating around such as incorruptibility, truth, everlasting life. It's kind of this like five-fold realm. It doesn't quite have form, but there are kind of the lofty spiritual concepts that are kind of contained within it, such as uh, everlasting life, foreknowledge, incorruptibility, truth, as I've already said. Um, and they kind of make up the realm of the father, but that's again, not quite tangible. So we have to kind of move down a level. And of course, uh, the Gnostic, uh, Pleroma and the structure of the heavenly realm is a system of emanation. So it's not kind of the, the triad necessarily like we see in Platonism, but is a, a definitely a system of emanation. So as we go down into the next rung, we have the realm of Barbello, the heavenly redeemer, the highest ontological feminine principle. Um, in kind of Gnostic cosmology. Um, we do have other feminine principles, which I promise we'll get to. Um, so, but uh, one unique thing about Balbello is that she arises 
from the first thought of the father and she is in the image of the father. Okay, she asked the father for foreknowledge. Um, and I would actually argue that Barbello is some kind of embodiment of Plato's or I guess of Middle Platonism's indefinite dyad. Not Plutarch's, obviously, uh, but uh, yeah, other Middle Platonists indefinite dyad. She has all those uh, feminine embodiments. She's this like hardcore, higher order spiritual principle, but she does have the mechanisms within her to then go on to create and manifest and make things more tangible. Absolutely. Again, in- incomplete agreement. <laughs> and, it, and if you disagree out there, uh, email Jason at NosicWisdom.net. Okay, continue. <laughs> um, so I would also say that uh, Barbello, she, her, her name also can be Protonoia. Um, so, sorry, that's just my cat scaring me jumping on, on, on the couch there. Um, so she describes herself uh, using aritology. She uses all of these ego statements, the I am statements, especially if you read the very end of the Apocryphon of John, there's the hymn of the monad there. But when you read Trimorphic Protodoya itself, you hear Barbello speaking to you with her own voice. And she says a whole heap of statements. I am such and such. I am the voice of the father. I am the voice of the invisible spirit, etc., etc. But she has a very di- kind of like direct and deeply personal interaction um, um, in, in much of the Sethian literature. Um, so she's, she calls herself a voice that lives within the invisible spirit. She is the knowledge of everlasting things, the uninterruptible power, the ineffable mother. She originates from herself. So again, Barbello also embodies these kind of paradoxes. She is the father, but she's also not the father. She's the mother, but she's also the father, but she's also the son. So it's, it's also, it's very confusing, but she's kind of, the confluence of paradox, I, I suppose, is, is what they're trying to get at. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. And, and again, it's, 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 you know, you can look at it on one hand and be like, that's just nonsense, right? But on the other hand, yes. I, it's very, it's very sophisticated. It's, it's playing yes. with paradox and contradiction. And it's almost like, uh, and I think it is that the point of it is, if, you know, uh, the, the, to kind of get out of uh, history into, into spirituality, it's like the Zen koans, right? They expand the brain as you try yes. to figure out what this is. Also, could you give us a rough translation of protonoia? Um, I just believe that protonoia is kind of like uh, foreknowledge or kind of forethought. But there are different kind of translations depending on the context. But in general, I think that's that's basically what it means. Yep. Um, fun fact, though, we have no direct translation for Barbello. Um, <laughs> it's kind of uh, one of those kind of possibly a made-up word. There are some scholars who believe it kind of originates as kind of a uh, a uh, female expression of Yahweh. There's kind of uh, some kind of hint there, but there's nothing concrete. Um, so yeah, so I've heard theories was- ranging from from the four and one to prune tree. So mm. <laughs> that, that's quite that. That's a pretty big uh, range. Uh, yeah, but yeah, the four and one I think has more credence when you actually read the text and see how kind of uh, I guess diverse or kind of how complex Barbello is because not only is she an entity, she's also an Aeon at the same time, right? So Yep. Yeah. And again, you have a lot to explain what an Aeon is, but you'll get there. And, and again, <laughs> just, just to hammer some things home, right? This is, you know, forethought. Uh, we, we can easily kind of pick up the metaphor or the idea because you paused and you read the text, right? This mm. is this this is kind of like a giant brain thinking about itself when you're reading about mm. the, these emanations, you know? So things are working yeah. on, on a few different levels, which again is very platonic right a, a yeah. lot of these uh these platonist thinkers uh are are you know uh, saying that that these things are reflected uh throughout the cosmos and reflected into the human being so there's uh there's lots going on uh in all sorts of uh different realms different ideas uh different levels yeah i like to think of it as kind of a refraction or kind of some some kind of like infinite kind of uh self-perpetuating object that's kind of looking into itself but is also generating something outside of itself you know one of those kind of cool psychedelic fractals that kind of move in and outside of itself yeah that's kind of what i think of it but that doesn't yeah. make anything any more clear unfortunately no no i, I don't think it, it it does to me but okay everybody okay pause okay so you read the text go out and get some lsd <laughs> come back and reread the text um okay continue Okay, so um, so Barbello is also the first thought, the Ennoia, um, in the image and spirit of the Father. 
She is from the image of the Father. She embodies his light. She is perfect in power. She is an image of the invisible, perfect virgin spirit. So that line is directly from the Apocryphon of John. So essentially, Barbello is the physical uh, manifestation of all of the powers of the Father, whereas the Father is, un- and I'm talking about the unknowable Father, is completely unknowable. Barbello uh, embodies those same kind of uh, powers, but in some kind of uh, tangible way or a way that's more kind of palatable to human mind and understanding. Um she is also called providence or pranoia or ennoia, um, the self-aware thought. Of course, yes, she is foreknowledge. Um, so she kind of also appears under numerous names within the kind of corpus of Sethian literature. She is the mother. She is ennoia. She is pro- pronoia, protonoia. She is the aeon giver. There's so many. And, of course, our audience has just read all these things, um, so she would know. But she's also described as the living waters, the, the reflection through which uh, Yaldabaoth, and spoiler alert, we will get to Yaldabaoth and Demiage, um, but the living waters are what uh, Babylon sends forth uh, to Yaldabaoth so that he's able to create the spiritual Adam, right? Um, and she's also, like we were saying, there's a lot of metaphors, a lot of kind of uh, sentiments of reflection, um, but quite literally she is described as through the metaphor of a mirror. So she reflects the light of the Father. So there's, yes, there's this kind of dichotomy that's happening, this reflection. Um, but already we can see going from Platonism to even just these kind of higher ontological principles, there's a lot that's happening in here that is not explicitly uh, kind of given to us in Platonism, right? So there's like trickles of Platonism, but it's also a very independent thing as well, right? Yeah, we're also only on, what, about the second or third page of the Apothecata, John? <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh no it's it, it, it it's 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 astounding stuff but you can see like they are they're kind of filling in the blanks for genesis yeah. but as you're saying they're kind of filling in the blanks for platonism yeah they're yeah. kind of merging the two together right um yeah. in a really interesting way and a lot of it doesn't make sense because it's paradoxical but you can see where these kind of ideas are heading right you can see how the yeah. two are kind of coming together you know, it's funny, it's paradoxical, but the way it's laid out is logical, if that makes yeah, sense, in a narrative yeah. way, right? So you, yeah. it's almost like a, like a Greek logical structure, but yeah. when you actually try to, like, process it logically, it goes, boink, brain broken. <laughs> and I think also that you're, that's what's supposed to happen, too, right? Your brain has to get broken. And, you know, I've discussed this with Bishop Tim many, many times. And, you know, you, you should never just read any book in the Nagamati Corpus once. And if, if you've only read it once, then you're completely doing an injustice to both the book and yourself. Because yep. each time you read it, as you move through life, as you learn different things, you will pick up another piece of the puzzle. So by the 300th reading, you'll have a much kind of more full-bodied understanding of the text and how it plays out into your own spiritual experience rather than just reading it once and kind of being confused and then just moving on. So Yeah, exactly. And I uh I, I literally and this isn't a brag because, you know, the text isn't that long, right? The Secret John, the Apothecon of John. But you know, I, I literally don't know how many times I've read it. It's a lot. <laughs> you yeah. know, the dozens and maybe dozens and dozens. And and I, I do get something new out of it every time. And then there's stuff in it that's so obvious. And I'll read it and I'll be like, how did I miss that? Yeah. You know, the last 10 times I read it, right? And as you say, it, it changes as you grow and as you go through life. So, yeah. Everybody that's what goes, I love about it too. Yeah. It's free. It's free online. It's not that long. Yeah. It's confusing, but it's not thing. that long. It's, exactly. I'd say it's like under, I guess, Trimorphic Protonoa would be like, I don't know, 12 pages. Yeah. Maybe uh, the, the long version of Pocket Fun of John is, is a bit longer than that, but it's, it's, it's reading. It's not, you don't have to sit through hundreds and hundreds of confusing pages. It's very short, yep. which of course our listeners have already done by now. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so moving on to the next kind of uh, concept within the Pleroma or the structure of the kind of the, the Pleroma, the higher realm is of course the sun, which is something that's completely non-existent in the Platonic literature. So, the way that the son is created is that the father looks into, and this is the unknowable father, looks into Barbello and from that kind of boring into her, I guess, soul or kind of this kind of deep spiritual connection, um, a spark of light is conceived and that spark of light turns into the son. 
um, which is similar but not quite equal to the best blessedness of Barbello. And it's also called The Only Begotten Child of the Pure Light. Yeah, thank you. This is S-O-N, by the way. Yes, son. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sorry. Yes, yeah, my yeah. Australian accent. S O N. Yes. Yeah, no. This is this is what I got to. This, this is hey. This is what I'm here for. Yes. <laughs> to give those clarifications. But yes, uh, uh, yes. As, as I've said many times, people people can stay at home and uh, listen to this, and they can be like, "I want to have a fun drinking game." Every time John <laughs> says "continue," then take a shot, and you'll be dead <laughs> by the time the, of alcohol poisoning. By the time this is uh, over, where was I? Please continue. Um, <laughs> shots. Uh, yeah. So, so the son, the S O N, is also called the Anointed One, right? The he's anointed with the invisible spirit's goodness. Um, the child is already self-aware, and the first thing it asks for when it is created is for the divine mind, is for noose, which it is granted. And this is all from the Apocryphon of John. Um, the child asked asks to act through the word, through the logos of the invisible spirit. And so therefore there's this kind of uh, this, this notion of will becoming action, will becoming word, something that's more tangible. So whereas the, the mind, the noose of God is, is still quite a lofty idea uh, through the embodiment of the sun, the, the mind of God becomes the word, becomes the logos, which is something that is more easily transmissible and transmitted and understood by us lowly folk here in the material realm. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, the, the the key the key feature of the sun is that it creates everything through the word, through the logos. Um, there's these kind of sentiments of everlasting life um, that is. It is the combination of mind and foreknowledge, and those two come together in the embodiment of the word. Um, as I've said, he's, he's the only begotten child. There is no other kind of uh, divine child that comes from this union of the unknowable father and Barbello. It's only the son, the begotten son, um, and he's kind of a direct manifestation of the pure light. And his purpose is to, in the Apocryphon of John anyway, is to come to illuminate those who dwell in darkness. And, and here, here is, is an example of what I mean is uh, when you read the different Gnostic texts, you have a very different iteration of what that means of the people. First, uh, first of all, of who these people are that he's coming to save, that changes between texts. Um, who he is an embodiment of changes between texts. And his kind of divine purpose or his kind of divine embodiment or his shape changes also between texts. Yeah, so we just make it easy for you folks. All yeah. this stuff is so simple. <laughs> um, which, of course, our friendly listeners have already read in the texts, right? Exactly. So, for examples, so the sun has many faces, right? He's come to illumine those who dwell in darkness. Um Specifically in the uh, trimorphic protonoia, he is in one instance the Logos incarnate, but because that text is centered on Barbello, uh, one of the descents that Barbello makes into our, our lowly realm in the Kenoma, in the material realm, is that sh her spiritual essence is encapsulated in the body of Jesus. So here is one thing that kind of uh, I wouldn't necessarily classify the Sethian literature as Christian or categorically Christian, but there are like hints like that that kind of are dropped into the text that kind of suggests like, mm, well, something something was brewing, something was happening at this time, right? Um, they might not be overtly kind of you know hinting at the scriptures, but there are kind of those little pearls that are kind of dropped in. So so that's one iteration. In the Gospel of the Egyptians, um, the Logos or the Sun is embodied through Seth, and it is actually Seth that descends from the Pleroma, again takes on the form of Jesus and is there as a kind of emissary to the Sons of Light, the Chosen Few, and uh, from there he awakens the Divine Spark and then he's able, they are able to have their own salvation. Um, but really, I guess the kind of crux, crux in that is that Jesus is not seen as a holy person. He's just some regular dude. He's just like a, a skin suit, basically, that the Logos incarnates into in order to uh, get the divine spark happening in certain people, and his job is done. That's, that's all he's sent there to do. He is the vessel. It is the Logos. It is Barbello. It is Seth that actually is making this stuff happen. And I think that's a really important distinction 
that gets lost um, as we move into full-blown Christianity. Um, so just one more thing about the sun. Um, he's also called the crown of silent silence. So he's kind of like the cap seal. Um, we have uh, the unknowable father and he's kind of like uh, the lowest iteration of the father and he's kind of like the crown um, through and the crown is then kind of uh, placed onto the heads of Gnostics who through their Gnosis are, of course are awakened um, but he represents the glory of the father the virtue of the mother and he actually within within his constitution in the Pleroma in the divine realm he brings forth the seven powers of great light, um, but also specifically the four luminaries, um, which again is something I'll get into in a minute. But the four luminaries are unique in Gnosticism. We don't see any iteration of any luminaries um, in in kind of the Platonic um, cosmological schema. Um, but Jonathan, is there anything you'd like to say about the sun? No, you're all good. <laughs> Oh, I keep right. I keep muting myself because I have uh, the, there's there's some noise in my around me uh, uh, this evening. So, but uh, uh, girl, keep going. <laughs> okay. Um. So then, uh, across the board, it's pretty standard uh, who the four luminaries are across all the Sethian literature. Although the spelling of some names change every now and then, depending on which text you're reading. But for the most part, the four luminaries are Hamazel. Aurel, Devathai, and Elaleth, and they're always kind of given in that order. Um, and they're kind of uh, a bit ambiguous. That it's not quite certain um, if they're kind of spiritual entities in their own right or if they are kind of bigger embodiments of specific aeons. It's kind of a bit ambiguous. It's not quite clear. They're probably both in some ways. Um, but a as aeons or as spiritual entities, they also have this kind of uh, this kind of uh, retinue of ministers, um, and you know a, a lot of their ministers are uh, you know the names are very common to us now. For example, uh, Gabriel, he is a minister of the great uh, Oriel. Um, but, th but these uh, these four lights, these four luminaries, they come into being through the intention of uh, of the sun. Uh, I also forgot to mention that he's also called the Autogenes, and um, that's also one of his titles as well. So um, the what realm does that, of... Sorry, what does that word mean, roughly translated? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it means uh, my Greek is not too good. Um but it's the the firstborn, I think. Um, yeah, I, be, uh, I believe that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, yeah, yeah. Like the I, first I, child, I think, is child, basically yeah, yeah. what it is. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. So yeah. Um. So yes. Yeah, so the four luminaries come into being. So the the first um is Davathai, which means understanding, mm -hmm. and within the realm of understanding come love. Um, and ideas and they're kind of uh, the main kind of um, ideas that are present in that realm um, the second uh, second luminary is Harmazel um, who embodies the realm of grace and mm -hmm. from that realm comes truth and comes form which is really in interesting um, yeah. so the, the third realm or third aeon is Aurel and from that um, realm comes conceptualization, perception and memory and here is the big one from the very fourth realm, uh, the realm of Elalith, comes perfection, comes peace, and of course, the last one is wisdom or Sophia. Yeah. Um, and, and to pause, you know, the, the, they're kind of depicted as as entities, but as you're saying, also realms, but also ideas, but also, yeah. uh, and, and of course, you know, to, to make things obvious again, right, to go back to the platonic forms, you know, yeah. they're, 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 we yeah. seem to have some connections. I know that, that our very intelligent audience at home are making these connections, but when you're reading the text, which you just read, it, it does, it's like, okay, what, are, what is, is, is it an entity? Is it a place? Yeah. Is it aeon means a length of time? Is it a length of time? The answer to yeah. those three questions is yes. <laughs> yes full stop yes yeah. yes yeah um yeah it's not really clear and like i said it kind of changes in some texts they're kind of entities in other texts they're like full-blown cosmic concepts in other texts they're aeons which seem to suggest some kind of uh connotations with time or space it's not really 
quite clear what exactly an aeon is. It's never really defined, but it's kind of like this uh, multifarious cosmic concept, I suppose, I guess. But um, the most important for our understanding is um, the realm of El Aleph, um, because it's the realm of Sophia, of divine wisdom. And most importantly, Sophia is always the very last aeon or entity that's created within the whole entirety of the Pleroma. Um, now, Sophia herself, I think we can move on to, um, and she's a really interesting character. Um, I'm Sorry, really and not, I, I, yeah. you know, all, all this sounds like really complicated and advanced, but sometimes I like to point out like how simple this stuff is in, in some ways, right? Some of the yeah. metaphors, I mean, some of the metaphors are quite com- complex. They work on different levels, but it's like, okay, wisdom comes last. Like, what, mm-hmm. what does that mean? Maybe we should think about that a little bit. How do we get to wisdom? How do we achieve it? Why does it come last? You know, mm-hmm. I, I think the texts want us to meditate upon this personalize it bring it into our lives and then you know at the at the end of the day sometimes these these very profound cosmic things become very obvious and almost like fortune cookie advice you know and uh, you know we we can we can blast that out we can expand that later perhaps but just just wanted to get another little interruption in there uh so uh everybody take a shot and joanne continue (laughs) um i think also a good thing to point out as well is that wisdom or sophia yes she's the last creation in the pleroma but for a good person a good rational soul that it's not uh you know involved in the material realm who has done the work and is now ascending up to the pleroma wisdom is actually the first entity that one would encounter right um which is why i guess uh wisdom has such a profound impact on well there's a lot of wisdom literature through many different uh, uh traditions particularly the egyptian tradition Um, But also in Judaism, there's a whole kind of book of wisdom. It's Proverbs, right? Um, And she actually says in Proverbs, uh, I can't remember which verse, but I was with God in the beginning before creation. So so I think it's interesting that kind of that play, that dichotomy where we're thinking like, oh, wisdom, that's the last to be created. But from our perspective going up, it's like the first thing, first heavenly being that we encounter is wisdom right and we can't really proceed any further unless we become wise or have this kind of gnostic experience through gnosis right exactly exactly yeah so uh yeah so we can kind of keep that in the back of our minds because i'm gonna totally dump on sophia right now um i'm not her biggest fan um, no no and it did i was really i should have called you the embodiment of uh barbello because (laughs) and this is you know a lot of times uh it's hard to go on another another digression but this is a digression show so in modern (laughs) gnosticism we are we often slam together a lot of texts a lot of traditions and we just kind of use sophia as a placeholder for a lot of different yeah. figures yeah. and when you read the Sephian text and i think uh, a lot of scholars are, are doing some better work on this she's a much more ambiguous figure um mm. and and that kind of comes out again in, in the chaldean oracles with, with hecate right uh yes. and uh who, who I, which i think is influenced by the by the Sephian text so you know i want to have that clarification and, and you know sophia does sort of have um uh, 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 she's not as as much of an ambiguous, possibly uh, uh, figure in in other Gnostic texts and in other wisdom traditions, other esoteric traditions. It's much more clear that she's great. Yeah. Um, but sometimes yeah. we read the Sephian texts through the lens of those other texts. Mm. Um, and yeah, so a lot of times in in modern uh, Gnostic church liturgies and our prayers, uh, you know, we, we're not quite talking about the Sephian. Sophia, even if we're sometimes using kind of a Sepian worldview, right? We are slamming together a lot of stuff. So, you know, uh, to to take a shot, continue. (laughs) Well, the the interesting thing about Sophia as well is that, um, you know, in in a Sepian context, as you were saying, she has all these different roles in different texts. And I think this is, and this is the hill I'm going to die on, uh, that when people think of Gnosticism, they tar the brush and they, they say, oh, Sophia, she's responsible for the doom of humanity and she created evil and so and so and so on. But when you read the text, I mean, that might be true in the Apocryphon of John in some ways, but that's absolutely not the case um, in a lot of other books, which we're going to go through in a second. Um, but also uh, the Sethian Sophia is incredibly different to, for say, for example, the Valentinian Sophia and how the Valentinians go on and kind of emanate, uh, sorry, not emanate, uh, they kind of elevate Sophia to this kind of 
goddess kind of figure, right? And they kind of uh, base their whole kind of central uh, salvation narrative around the redemption of Sophia. That's kind of uh, the Valentinian vibe. We're not doing that, however. <laughs> We're going to the into the Sethian text, um, and and so this is basically, in a nutshell, what, what kind of Sophia symbolizes um, in the Sethian in the Sethian text. So, of course, she is a personification of wisdom, of divine wisdom, and in every text, in every iteration, she's always the last aeon, and she's always connected with the realm of Elalith. Um, she, so let's kind of unpack what else is in the realm of Elalith. So we have perfection and we have peace. So that's interest, an interesting mix. Wisdom goes along with perfection, goes along with peace. That, okay, well, that's fine. Um, but also, I guess one main thing that we can take from the Apocryphon of John, um, which isn't kind of explicitly laid out, is that all these kind of luminaries and entities that I've just gone through in the Pleroma, uh, their divine consort is not actually named. Like it's implied that there's some kind of male, female, possibly counterparts to each of these entities, but they're not named. So here it gets quite confusing because the whole story and the kind of corruption and downfall of Sophia begins with her kind of uh, self-creation without the permission or without the, you know, uh, the understanding of her divine counterpart. Who is not named, and we'd know nothing about them. Don't know who that is. <laughs> I, I, always so frustrating when you're reading the text, but it's, yes. it's obviously deliberate that they leave yeah. it out. Which is okay. What it was? You, did did the oral tradition fill that in? Because there's probably an oral tradition that goes wrong with the Apocryphal John, yeah. or is it one of those mysteries that that you're supposed to figure out? Because I believe the text does deliberately. Leave, it's a very, it's a very intricately deliberately constructed meta text yeah. there's there's yeah. not very many mistakes in it so sometimes you can read text you know like genesis where you're smashing together a bunch of different sources you know and, and there's just plain mistakes you don't really see that in the apocryphal john so there's a reason why and you know we'll probably never know the reason why but one might be is you're supposed to think about it and figure it out for yourself but yeah. uh you know what i'm gonna say thanks shock continue <laughs> um so that's interesting because uh that brings up the possibility well is her consort or is her divine partner one of the other ideas in the realm is it perfection is it peace or is it something completely different that's kind of unknown that we have to kind of ponder we're all i think quite drunk from the shots at this point so maybe that's going to give us a you know a, a bit of a different understanding so if anyone has any ideas pop them in the chat yeah um, please yeah please let us know um <laughs> and, and as well, it kind of makes, because, you know, you, you can kind of read, I think they are thinking about the Garden of Eden story, even though that does come up later, you know, and, yeah. and some people have said, oh, okay, well, this, this is a sexist story, right? But I, mm. I, I think you can you can look at it and be like, we don't know who her consort is. Yeah. Um, and the name is left out. And I, I think that that makes it less sexist. You know, if, if, if it said, you know, this is her consort, he was really angry at her because he, he, she created it without him. But instead, we have this, this mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in an enigma, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it's almost like, as well, you know, the, the, uh, maybe Sophia was meant to figure it out. Who, who knows? Lot, lots of possibilities. Yeah. So I guess uh, in the Apocryphon of John, well, I guess we'll do that first because it's kind of like the most teased out version of this story. The others, uh, like you'll see, it's not really uh, prominent. But uh, so Sophia is the last kind of Aeon entity, whatever, to be created in the realm of Elalith. And there's this uh, unfolding of this story that happens around F Sophia where she starts this kind of motion. She begins to think for herself, Right. She uses this kind of uh, foreknowledge of the father. She perhaps taps into like the powers of Barbello, which are permeated all throughout this kind of pleroma. And she starts to kind of, you know, she thinks for herself and she has these ideas that I, I think it's coming from a good place. She's kind of so in love and so kind of wants to emulate the goodness and the perfection and the light of the unknowable father, which she sees in the reflection of Barbello that she kind of, is inspired, have, divinely inspired perhaps, and wants to create some kind of image uh, uh, as replication of that herself, right? So it's, it's, she goes, it's like yeah. it's, it's, she wants to emulate the unknown father, but she also wants yeah. to be like him and to know him. But what's yeah. the problem with, with knowing the unknown father? You, you can't know the unknown oh, father. That's right. And, yeah. and maybe, maybe that's why things go wrong. Yeah, exactly. 
Yep. And I think it's interesting that they've put all this happening in in the kind of personification of divine wisdom, right? Which you think would go hand in hand with some semblance of knowing the Father too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then Sophia goes on to create. Um, she self-generates, she self-creates without the consent of her consort or the spirit. Sorry, my mic just dropped then. Um which which I guess is also paradoxical paradoxical in a way because it's hard to imagine if she's using the or tapping into these kind of higher order concepts of Barbello, she's thinking for herself, you'd think, well, wouldn't she think that she needs uh, to ask her consort or she needs the kind of input of her consort because, I don't know, maybe I, I always just thought, like, why didn't she ask someone or if she's tapping into this knowledge, why wouldn't she think that? But then maybe I'm thinking too much into it. But Anyway, um, Sophia in herself is she's in, endowed with this power, this unconquerable oh, power. I do, I do have an interruption as well because yeah, it's, sure, a, it's, it's, it's a favorite Bishop Tim point, which is you know all all the all the previous creation and the emanations and the pairing that there's permission being asked, but it's not just permission. Things are happening in unity. They're happening in yeah. a kind of divine community, right? So it's not that we have this 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 uppity lady deciding to do something by herself. In my yeah. reading, it's that. You know, there might also be a metaphor here about what happens when you when you do things outside of community. What happens when you're doing things outside of unity, right? Uh, so I, I I think that's that's kind of a point to hammer home, and I I, I can hear his his voice in the back of my head being uh, uh, saying that. So uh, I yes, I, yes, I, I have I've summoned him. I have said his words. They have passed through me. Uh, uh, now I will banish him. Okay, <laughs> no, he can stay. That's fine. Um, yeah, I think that's a really great point as well. So it's not just, you know, some naughty uh, person, this naughty lady going off in the corner and kind of self, you know, uh, creating and creating this what turns out to be a, quote, misshapen being, unlike herself, end quote, uh, with the form uh, of a dragon, with a lion's head, with eyes flashing, lightning bolts, the whole kit and caboodle, the whole kind of a horrible, like, demon kind of entity image that again is uh, the Gnostics are tarred with uh she's not doing that on purpose it's kind of just uh I think her intentions are good and I think she's obviously misguided in some way and, and this is the result of what happens right um however virtually immediately after this entity which is named Yaldabaoth um is born Sophia recognizes her ignorance and she's like oh shit you know, I oh, I don't know if I can swear on this show, but uh, she <laughs> she she recognizes that ignorance and she immediately surrounds him in the cloud. Like she's like, oh, oh my god, I've done something. I know this is not what it's supposed to be. I've just got to sort this out now. She kind of takes that responsibility, but she also is kind of leaving this entity creation to fend for itself perplexed in a world that's just been born into that makes no sense and is now obscured by a cloud so that's kind of the, the story of the creation of Yaldabaoth slash the demiurge in the in the uh, apocryphon of john um but i kind of want to look at the same story in the trimorphic protonoia and in the gospel of the egyptians because the story is very very different um so uh, so we have this kind of allusion to this same kind of creation that happens in the trimorphic protonoia, although it's kind of, uh, it's implied, it's not ex as quite as explicitly detailed as it is in the Apocryphon of John. Uh, but Barbello actually steps in for Sophia and proclaims that she's innocent, you know, uh, that Sophia, poor Sophia, she's innocent, and it was actually Yaldabaoth that just kind of naturally uh, because he's this kind of weird, malevolent uh, entity, kind of sprang forth from, like, he was hiding within her and he kind of comes forth, right? Um, and so this is uh, a catalyst for what what everyone's just read in the Trimorphic Protonoia is the first descent of Barbello, right? She, yep. Barbello, has to descend to the earth on account of the part of the spirit, the part of the Paroma, the part of the light that remains in Yaldabaoth, that it was essentially stolen by Yaldabaoth when he kind of extricated himself out of Sophia. Yeah. Um, so. And, and also, I, I, I don't want to criticize anybody's questions about Gnosticism, their understanding about Gnosticism, but yeah, th there's a lot of people online, a kind of a recurring question, which, which again is a, uh, something to, uh, 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 that's something, uh, 
that the people online ask a lot, which is, you know, why why doesn't the Pleroma just snap its fingers and get rid of Yada Bay off, right? Why why don't the why why don't they just do the genie uh, blink and, and, and make him <laughs> disappear? But but yeah, again, we're, we're dealing with layers upon layers of of metaphor, which also aren't metaphors, which are also realities. But mm-hmm. this is this is the plan. This is how it's done, right? This yeah. is like this is the answer to your question. This this is this is how the light is being reclaimed. It's all yeah. there in the text. Please stop going on Reddit and being like, "Why don't Pleroma Blink Eye kill Demiurge?" Um, okay. <laughs> Hashtag yeah. Hashtag um, yeah. So. So that's, I think, a really interesting point is that uh, there's this kind of inherent innocence of Sophia. She's kind of in the trimorphic be- progenoa being kind of absolved of any of this kind of uh, premeditation of wanting to create without her partner's consent, etc. Um, but it interestingly gives Yaldabaoth his own agency um, as a separate entity or as a separate being. And uh, it also goes on to explain that Yaldabaoth uh, means he who has taken power. Uh, who had snatched it away from the innocent one, Sophia, who had earlier overpowered her, who is the light Epinoia, who has descended her from whom he had come forth from originally. So that quote was from Tramothic Protonoia explaining um, kind of the intention behind the other Bayoth wanting to extricate himself. Um, yeah, he, he's kind of overpowered her. He's kind of uh, pushed her to the corner while he's, you know, erupted from her belly or whatever. And he's kind of, become you know like kind of like the imagery of like zeus uh sorry athena erupting from the head of zeus right and she's fully formed and she has all this power and she's ready to go right and that and so, that's not just a uh the, a random comparison again these are meta texts yeah, yeah this absolutely is, this is a, they're thinking about this myth when they're writing this and again you can read these texts not just uh, not just pafragon or john as we're talking about these other texts yeah. and you can start picking out these references they're very sophisticated yeah. and i keep saying you know meta text maybe uh there's a term that that's recent within the last 20, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, I guess it's not that new, but Umberto Echo talks about hypertexts and he sees them as, as hypermodern, but actually I'd argue that these are the first hypertexts. Mm. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah. Anyways, this hyper guy likes to interrupt with his hyper comments. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I just very lastly about Sophia, I just want to touch on the gospel of the Egyptians because it is so left field. It has such yeah. a completely different explanation of this whole story, right? Yeah, which so is fun. Take, it's so yeah, much which fun. is fun. I'm here yeah. for it. It's great. Um, so let me just take you back into the creation of the realm of Elleth, right? So that's fine. Sophia is the last to be created. The Pleroma is kicking on. It's happening. And the text actually says, after 5,000 years, okay, so everything's perfect and happy, but 5,000 years later, the great light Elaleth spoke and said, quote, let someone reign over the chaos and Hades, end quote. And there appeared a cloud whose name is Helix Sophia. And this is really annoying, this text, because there is a lot of lacunas in the text and there's a lot of lacunas, which just mean missing pieces, that are specifically in this passage. So it's hard to kind of keep up, but I'll do my best. Um, so just to reiterate, and there is a cloud whose name is Helix Sophia, lacuna. She looked out on the parts of the chaos, her face being like lacuna in her form, lacuna blood. And the great angel Gamaliel spoke to the great angel Gabriel, the minister of the great light Oriel. He said, let an angel come forth in order that he may reign over the chaos and Hades. End quote. So here we have a completely different iteration of uh, Sophia is only mentioned as Helix Sophia. You know, uh, I think that just means like the heavenly Sophia, which I think is a concept that's kind of really teased out in the Valentinian system. But here we have a period of like relative peace and prosperity or whatever happening is happening in the Pleroma. After 5,000 years, LLF said, well, you know, I guess there's chaos and stuff that's reigning beyond me, guys. Like we need someone to kind of uh, figure that out or to, uh, someone to rule over this kind of chaos in Hades. And um, that person happens to be Yaldabaoth. And uh, the the interesting thing about what happens in the kind of the gospel of the Egyptians as well is that Yaldabaoth is part of a divine pair. And Yaldabaoth is actually the good guy in this situation. So there is another uh, demon or entity called Saklas, um, 
which is kind of like the the evil twin, whereas the other Baos is the good twin, and they go out and descend into the realm of, uh, I guess, the primordial material realm. And uh, Yeldabaoth is trying to be a good guy and trying to order the chaos, as the angels have just told us here, whereas Saklas is the evil one who wants to, like, get dominion and power, and he goes on to create the Archons, which we'll speak about in a moment. And then this whole situation unfolds, right? But, like, how mind-blowing is that, that there's a completely other iteration of this whole story? Um, and it's very, very different. And here, again, Sophia is just kind of mentioned in passing. She's not even pivotal to this story in any way. It's it's very interesting because again, you know, these these the people who wrote this text or the person who wrote this text or the community that created this text knows those other texts and they're you know, they're they're probably. Um and you know they're Most doing likely, some yeah. Yeah, yeah, quite likely, almost certainly. So it's like, well, what, what are they doing, right? It's it just, it's just, we're constantly flipping things on their head, and then flipping, you know, we're flipping Plato and Genesis on its head, and then taking yep. that flip and flipping it again. To be continued in part three of three.